Hi, excursionists. Welcome to the first episode of 2022. Into the Night is still officially on hiatus until March, but I wanted to bring you a Valentine's Day special because we all need a little love in our lives. I also wanted to make one more announcement. Just before the end of 2021, Into the Night became a part of the A Fool's Quest family. I'm happy to announce that that family has grown and has a new name. Creative Typo Entertainment is a new podcast network. This creative collaboration will not only have your favorite podcasts, like Into the Night, A Fool's Quest, and the companion show Ethereal Embrace, but will bring in our partner shows of Microphones of Monsters and Stick Shifts Incorporated. There are many new and exciting things coming in the near future, so please keep listening and sharing, and be sure to check out our new shows as they release. Welcome to Into the Night. I'm Nari, your guide on today's excursion down a twisted path. Be careful not to get lost. Be it dark or light, it's easy to lose your way. Are you ready? Then let's begin. The Valentine Sunlight cast beams through the dust circulating in the musty attic. The chilled air in the drafty space had escaped the warmth of the crackling fire in the wood stove below. Still the quiet of the room, forgotten and ignored long ago by most who had lived in the old farmstead, brought a quiet solace to Cora Parker. The attic was one of her favorite sanctuaries. Life disillusioned Cora over the years, and since the time she was a child, she never quite fit in with the rest of the world. On many occasions, she cried and said, Mama, I don't understand. I don't belong here. Each time her mother cradled her in a comforting embrace and told her she belonged as much as anyone else did. But the loneliness and isolation haunted Cora. It's okay, sweet girl, her mother would say. You're only 12. You belong with the people who love you. This world needs kind-hearted little girls like you. Are you sure, Mama? I'm sure. You remind me so much of your great-grandma. She's who I named you after, you know. This caught Cora's attention, and she wiped her tears with the tissue her mother handed her. What was she like? Well, she was smart and beautiful and funny. Cora's grandmother tweaked the girl's nose. She had violet-colored eyes, just like you. And she could sing like an angel. And... And what? And she loved with a big heart. She was kind to animals and helped others whenever she could. What else, Mama? You look like there's something you aren't telling me. There is. Your great-grandma also knew sadness. Cora's mother rubbed her cheek with her hand and hesitated. What is it, Mama? I'm old enough. You can tell me. I suppose you are. It's a sad story, but it's one you should hear about. It shaped part of our family history. Matilda Parker now had her daughter's full attention. You see, before she met your great-grandfather Horace, she was madly in love with a young man named Claude Dow. Her heart was broken when Claude died in a railroad accident. What kind of accident? Was he run over by a train? No, but it was an avoidable tragedy that changed your great-grandmother's life forever. What happened, Mama? Claude worked on the train that ran through Charles City, and he was friends with the five or six other young men from around here who worked on it too. They were a fun-loving bunch, and Claude was known for having a good sense of humor. He got along with everyone, really, but that night the joking went too far. Cora leaned forward and held her chin in her hand as her elbow rested on the countertop. Did Claude make someone mad? No, something happened to him, though. You see, on nights when Claude saw Cora, his friends slowed the train down so he could jump off the rail stop near her home. This was back in the days when people either walked or rode horses to get around. Claude could spend more time with Cora if he didn't have to walk across town to see her. 
Well, one night, his friends thought it would be funny to not slow the train down. They kept it going at full speed as it passed through town. That was mean. Yes, it was. They knew they'd slow the train down just past the last stop, and I don't think any of them ever imagined that any harm would come from their prank. Cora's violet eyes grew wide. What did Claude do? He didn't know his friends were playing a trick. He panicked when he missed his stop. He'd promised Cora he'd see her that night, and he'd never broken a promise to her before. He must have really wanted to see her. He did. He had big plans, too. He was going to propose to her after the dance that night. So instead of waiting, he jumped off the train. He landed hard and was badly hurt. There was no way to save him. It wasn't like today when maybe he could have been flown to the emergency room. Even the town doctor couldn't fix what was wrong with Claude. Cora saw the accident because she waited for him at the stop like they'd planned. She rushed to him, but all she could do was hold him while he died. Oh, Mama, she had to be heartbroken. She was never the same afterward. They were both so young. She was 16 and Claude was 18. As fun-loving as my grandmother could be with us children, she always had a sadness in her eyes. When she thought no one was looking, sometimes I'd catch her staring out the window into the hills where she and Claude would go on walks. She just never recovered after losing him. She loved Grandpa Horace and was good to him, but a part of her died after she lost Claude. That's so sad, Mama. It was sad. Every once in a while, she told me the story about the day he died. I think sometimes she just had to talk with someone about it. She remembered everything like it was fresh and raw. His dying words were, I'll love you forever, Cora. If there's any way for me to be here with you, I will be. If you hear the birds singing or smell a fresh breeze blowing through the oak trees, that will be me letting you know I'm near. She said he'd always had a way with words. What about Grandpa Horace? What was he like? Did he... Did it make him sad to know that Great Grandma loved Claude? Horace, from all accounts, was a decent man, but a tad dull. He seemed unaffected by the subdued devotion Great Grandma Cora gave him. He was more concerned with planting crops, selling lumber, and making sure he had children to pass his family name down to. Romance and his wife's feelings were of little interest to him. If Cora had looked for a husband as unlike Claude as possible, Horace was the right choice. I seldom saw him smile or even hold a conversation for long. More tears welled in little Cora's eyes, and her mother gave her a hug. I wish I'd known her. She was lonely like me. Oh, Cora girl, you would have loved her. Please don't feel lonely. But Cora did. Yes, she had friends, but she never felt like she was part of the group. She seemed removed from the world around her. She loved her mama and papa, but few outside her home ever saw her carefree and happy. Most people accepted that Cora was withdrawn and introverted and didn't push the issue. She preferred walks in the woods and time spent at the family's quiet home to socializing with her classmates. The house that she adored had been passed down for generations. In fact, it was the home Horace Parker built for Cora when they wed. Lonely as she was, Cora's imagination was her best friend. She spent hours thinking about her great-grandmother and the tragic love story. I wish I'd known you, Grandma Cora. We would have been friends. I just know it. Too shy to talk to boys in town, Cora daydreamed about the dashing Claude. Family photos proved that he was indeed a looker. And sometimes, Cora imagined she was the original Cora. She pictured them on dates, and she'd blush, flattered by the love and attention of the handsome Claude. One quiet afternoon, she stared out her bedroom window. Cora saw them on romantic walks in the woods and envisioned Claude picking her wildflowers from the field. She found herself missing someone she'd never even met. How could great-grandma not fall in love with him? She had to be devastated when he died. Tears stained her cheeks if she dwelled on the horrific moment when Grandma Cora held the dying Claude in her arms. She felt the raw pain her grandmother experienced even across the span of all these years. 
Growing up, Cora listened to every family story she could and soaked up every tidbit of information possible about the woman she was named after. She marveled at old photographs. Mama is right. I do resemble my great-grandmother. Why have I put on that same dress and wore that hat? This photograph could be of me. During high school, still uncomfortable with people her own age, she volunteered at the local nursing home. Her mother worried. Cora, are you sure you don't want to work with the other kids at the community pool? I'm afraid the nursing home will be too depressing for a young girl. Mama, I love helping the old people. It's not depressing. I hold their hands and listen to them talk about when they were young. If you're sure it won't make you sad, okay. I'm fine, Mama, really I am. I think they are more interesting than young people anyway. There's a lot to learn from old people. They have so many stories to tell, and it makes them happy to have someone to talk to. I feel like I'm doing something worthwhile. Unable to think of an argument to counter her daughter's reasoning, Matilda Parker relented and let Cora volunteer as often as she wanted at the Hampton Manor Nursing Home. Cora thrived around her elderly friends. A few of the oldest residents had been small children when her great-grandmother was alive. What a treasure trove of stories they told her, and with each one Cora felt more connected than before to her long-ago family. After she graduated from high school, Cora left her hometown to attend college and become a librarian. She enjoyed books and interesting tales, and she could think of no better profession to match her interests and personality. She studied hard and graduated at the top of her class. As good fortune had it, her hometown library and historical museum posted an opening just as she entered the job market. The management was happy to have a local girl fill the position, and they remembered how quiet and studious Cora had been growing up. She was a perfect fit for the job, and Cora was happy to be back with her family at her beloved home. She knew every nook and cranny in the farmhouse, and she missed every one of them. As it had always been, the attic was one of her favorite places in the home. It was quiet, secluded, and full of history. Old family photographs, books from long ago, and old phonograph records sat in boxes waiting to be explored. After going through assorted boxes one day, Cora came upon a large trunk she had never noticed before, tucked in the corner of the room. What do we have here? This looks old. Really old. She tried to pry the lid open, then noticed the clasps that held it shut. Carefully, she undid each latch and lifted the lid. Her eyes lit up and her heart swelled at the contents. It's like opening a time capsule. Letters. Lots of letters. Doilies? A quilt made with the wedding ring pattern. Why, this is a hope chest of sorts. She gently unfolded the brittle pages of the letters to read them. Claude. These are love letters from Claude. As eager as she was to read them, she decided, as any good librarian would, to take a mental inventory of what lay before her. She sat the letters in one stack and items like the doilies in another. Photographs were placed to her right. When she picked up the quilt, she noticed a delicate, lace-trimmed red card resting in the folds, carefully preserved. It fluttered to the floor when she lifted the ornately stitched quilt. Cora bent down and gently opened it. It's a valentine he gave her. She read the note Claude included in the card. Dear Cora, my love for you will never fade. I've waited for the right moment to give you this, and I would wait for all eternity for you. Someday, I hope you feel the same. Please slip a note in this card to let me know if you feel the same. Yours truly, Claude. How sweet! This must be how he first told her he cared about her. Cora's imagination spun, and she was swept up by the romance of the card. I grew up fascinated by their love story, and here's how it began. For a moment, she stared at the valentine, wistful for that long-ago time when, had it not been for the tragic practical joke, her family history would have changed. If Claude hadn't died, there would be no sullen Horace Parker in family photographs. My great-grandmother wouldn't have had the haunting sadness in her eyes. So much would have been different. She envisioned decades of happy times for Cora and Claude. 
Christmas walks through the snowy town, summer picnics by the lake, and a house full of children. The boys, of course, would have looked like their handsome father. The girls would have had Cora's violet eyes. Suddenly aware of the long shadows cast by the fading light through the window, the young woman realized she should go downstairs and eat dinner. I've daydreamed long enough. The attic will be here tomorrow. I'll finish going through the trunk then. She turned and descended the stairs. Halfway down, she realized she still clutched the valentine in her hand. Well, I'll keep this with me until I can bring it back up tomorrow. Once downstairs, she took the card to her bedroom and set it on her desk. Hungrier than she'd realized, she headed to the kitchen to reheat last night's leftovers. She ate the last of the meatloaf at the kitchen table and stared out the window toward the wooded hills. Her mind whirled with thoughts about the trunk she discovered. After all these years, I'm actually able to hold and read the love letters Claude wrote to her. I've touched the quilt she made for when they were married. Only she never used it. She packed it and all her memories of Claude away in that trunk. The clock chimed in the parlor, signaling the late hour. She cleared the table, carefully washed the china plate, and returned to her room. She picked up the historical fiction book from her nightstand and tried to read, but her attention kept turning to the red valentine on her maple dresser. She rose from the bed and sat at her desk, rereading the note Claude had written. Write you back? Hmm. I know it's crazy, but maybe I should. Looking around her, she sighed. No one would even know of my foolishness, so what's the harm? Cora sat at her desk and reached for her favorite pen and her stationery pad. The smooth black ink flowed onto the page as she wrote. Dearest Claude, I have wanted to know you for so long. Please accept my invitation to write me back. Yours truly, Cora. She folded the stationery and placed it inside the valentine. She grabbed her flashlight off the shelf by the door before she stepped out of her room into the hallway. It's dark in the attic by now. I certainly don't want to fall down the stairs. I don't want to have to explain to Mama what I was doing fumbling around in the dark at this time of night. I don't think she'd understand me sneaking a note to a dead man. Carefully, she went down the hall, opened the attic door, and ascended the stairs. She walked, stooped over. This ceiling sure isn't designed for anyone over five feet tall. She walked softly to avoid drawing the attention of her parents down below. Slowly, she reached the south end of the attic where the trunk sat. She opened it and stared at the card one last time. Have I lost my mind? She shrugged, then slipped the card with her note into the folds of the quilt. Lowering the lid, she closed the clasps and made her way to the stairwell, then down to the hallway. Her face flushed. I do feel a little silly. Before returning to her bedroom, she listened to make sure no one had noticed her late-night jaunt to the attic. Relieved, she heard her father snoring in his recliner in the living room. The television played in her mother's bedroom. Reruns of Mama's favorite show. She'll be so glued to that TV that she wouldn't notice if the house was on fire. If she does ask me, I'll say I went to the kitchen to get a drink of water. Once in her room, Cora put on a few pajamas, read a few more pages of the book she started earlier, and drifted to sleep under the eider-down comforter on her bed. The next morning, running late for work, she didn't give the previous night's activities a second thought. A field trip of local elementary students was scheduled to arrive at 9 o'clock, and Cora needed to have the display in order before they went on the tour. That evening, she returned home frazzled by a hectic day. She almost didn't remember the card, but while lounging with her book on the bed, she saw the pen sitting where she had left it the night before on her desk. Her heart leaped. I should go look at the card. She caught a glimpse of herself in the mirror that hung on the wall above her desk. She paused. Are you nuts, Cora? Maybe she was. I know I won't rest until I see for myself that I did nothing more than feed into my childhood daydreams. Gingerly walking down the hall and up the stairs, Cora made her way back to the trunk. Her heart pounded as she lifted the lid and looked inside. The corner of the valentine stuck out from the folds of the quilt, right where she left it. Cora frowned and started to close the lid, but stopped. 
I'll never know for certain unless I take a look. She laid the trunk open again and reached in, picking up the card. Her hands trembled slightly as she opened it. My note is gone, and there is a different message written inside the card. My dear Cora, how I have waited and longed for this moment. All these years of wondering if I would ever hear from you were worth it. I know this must be confusing for you, but my love for you has never faded. Please write to me again. All my love, Claude. Cora's hands shook as she stared at the card in disbelief. Is someone playing a trick on me? But how? No one even knew I found the trunk or the valentine. On wobbly knees, she carried the card back downstairs to her bedroom. What should I say in return? She sat at her desk for some time, considering her note. Finally, she put pen to paper. Dear Claude, I would very much like to get to know you. I am confused, but I also feel this is a chance I must take. Please continue to write to me. Yours, Cora. She folded the note, slipped it in the card, and returned it to the quilt in the trunk. Night after night, she and Claude exchanged notes. Memories flooded Cora's mind of a life long ago, and a love that had not died after all. I don't know how this is possible, but I remember living as my great-grandmother. Maybe I am crazy, but for the first time in my life. Or is it this life? I don't feel alone. Time passed, and they wrote a new letter to each other every day. Finally, Claude asked if he could see her. Really see her. Would it be all right if he appeared to her? Cora jumped at the chance to see him. Evening after evening, Claude materialized. They held hands, walked in the moonlight, and rekindled the love affair begun over a century ago. Cora was nagged by a question she couldn't shake, however. Claude? Yes? How is this possible? How can it be that I'm the same Cora from years ago? I feel like I am. The memories are vivid. But how? The answer is simple. Cora held her breath, anticipating his next words. You came back because you couldn't leave me either. We were separated, torn apart. But before now, the timing wasn't right for us to find each other again. Had you died when I did, we would have been reunited, but that wasn't in the plans. You were meant to remain and marry Horace. But I never loved Horace. Not the way I love you, anyway. I know that. So did God. So did Horace. He needed you, though, and for reasons I can't get into right now, you were meant to have children with him. I think I understand, but I don't really know what you are talking about. It's okay, Cora. All that matters is that we are together now. A few times, her parents almost caught her with Claude. Her mother rapped on her door one night as she and Claude were deep in conversation, laughing and talking in the carefree way that lovers do. Cora, who are you talking to? I can hear you down the hall. I'm worried about you, her mother said. Let me in, please. With a nod, Claude disappeared, and Cora opened the door. Mama, there's no reason to worry. Who were you talking to? Her mother's eyes scanned the room. No one at all. Patting her mother's arm, she said, I was rehearsing the lines to a play. I didn't mean to worry you. Oh, good. I do worry about you, Cora. I hate that you are always so alone. I don't feel alone, Mama. I promise. Go back to bed. I'm okay. Well, if you're sure. I'm fine. I really do need to rehearse those lines a little more and then go to sleep. The two hugged and her mother left, closing the door behind her. When Cora turned around, Claude had returned. Their nightly visits continued for six months until Claude sat her down with a worried look on his face. Cora, I must talk with you. There are some things I need to tell you. Things I haven't been completely honest about. Cora rubbed her forehead with her hand and then looked up at Claude. What have you lied to me about? I never lied. 
I just didn't tell you everything. Like what? Like the reason you had to stay behind and marry Horace? I'm listening. It's because of something that hasn't even happened yet. Your mother's sister, Aunt Maddie, she has a son. Yes, Parker. He was named after our family name. Parker will have a son one day. He will discover a way to stop something bad from happening. It will save millions of lives. If you hadn't married Horace years ago, Parker's son would never have been born. I died, but you had to stay behind so Parker's son can save people. But my heart was broken over losing you. I know. Mine was too. When I died, I knew what had to be done. Claude paused, trying to find a way to explain it all. Remember when you escaped the fire shortly after I died? God asked me if I wanted you with me then, at the expense of millions of people later. I couldn't do that, so I asked for you to stay. Claude, you were all I could think of that night of the fire. No one could believe I made it out of that building unharmed. They said God had his hand on me. He did, Cora. I was beside you that night, too. You just couldn't see me. I watched you and followed you your entire life. Then why couldn't we be together when I finally died? It's not that simple. There's an order things must happen in. The universe is like a clock. The hands are controlled by gears and the timing must be precise. Just like a clock, we can't make something happen at two o'clock that can only happen at six. When you lived through the fire, we lost that opportunity. You were allowed to come back again because God knew the sacrifice we made to save others. This is so much to try to make sense of. I know, but we are here now. That's what matters. Cora took a deep breath. What else haven't you told me? Claude nervously bit his lip. Tell me, Claude. I love you beyond all measure. He squeezed her hand. I love you too, Claude. This isn't new information. What haven't I been told? He looked into her eyes. Do you love me enough to leave with me? Leave with you. Could you leave all this behind? He motioned to the room around them. Puzzled, Cora sat stunned. She thought about her aging parents. If you can't, I will understand. I may have been foolish to even consider it. Claude, I love you, and I would go anywhere with you. Do you mean that? Completely? I know you feel responsible for your parents. I promise you, though, they will be well cared for. I need to know if you will go with me. Yes, of course. What is this all about? This is what I haven't told you. Cora's heart pounded. I made a deal. A deal in hopes that we could be together again. We are together. What deal are you talking about? I told God, if he would let me come back to you, that I'd accept whatever terms he gave me. He allowed me to contact you, to even appear to you, to be able to hold you. It could only be until the date I died, however. Then I had to leave. Tears rolled down Cora's cheeks. That's tonight. You died on this night in 1896. I don't want to lose you again. Her voice caught as she sobbed. What do I need to do? I'll do anything to not lose you again. Claude held her hand and stood. She rose and looked into his pleading eyes. There's a way, but it means you have to come with me right now. I'm not allowed to stay here any longer. I'll begin to fade away by the time the clock strikes ten. You must decide what you want, and I will honor whatever decision you make, Cora. I told you, I'm going with you. Just tell me what to do. Claude picked up the valentine off the desk. They both glanced at the clock. Less than five minutes remained. If you're sure. I am. Please hurry. We're running out of time. We have to get back to the trunk. 
and we must have the valentine. The two lovers rushed to the attic. The trunk sat waiting for them. Claude draped the wedding quilt around them, and clutching the card, they stepped inside the open trunk. Cora's clothes turned into the Victorian dress she'd worn in the tattered engagement photo with Claude. Is this really happening? Yes, sweet Cora, it is. I've waited my whole life for this. And then some. Claude embraced her. I pledge you my love for eternity. He led her to a white staircase and pulled the lid closed, just as the grandfather clock in the parlor struck ten. In the Charles City Cemetery, at a simple grave site from 1896, two doves landed on the tombstone. The inscription read, Here lies Claude Dow. He will love her forever. And he did. Ten years later, Miles Calloway, son of Parker Calloway, was born. Forty years in the future, Dr. Miles Calloway would save millions of people with a medical breakthrough he discovered. That breakthrough, a way to regenerate a person's internal organs, would save patients from traumatic injuries, like the ones that killed Claude Dow in 1896. Thank you for joining me for Into the Night, an anthology series written by Caroline Giamanco, narration and sound design by Nari Kwok, theme music by Nico Rodriguez, all original music and editing in part provided by Flyboy Entertainment. You can find our links in the show notes. Please remember to like and subscribe, and if you enjoy what you hear, please leave us a five-star review to help other excursionists to join us. You can find us on your favorite podcast directory. See you next time. And remember... Whether in the shadows or in the daylight, all twisted paths take you into the night. Into the Night is a Creative Typo Entertainment production.